Professor Isaacson of the Aspen Institute. Uh, Olympia Snow is on the Bipartisan Policy uh, Committee uh, Senior Fellow, and our two groups have been dedicated in the past few years to making sure that we reduce the amount of partisanship and get government working again. You can see how successful we have been <laughs> over the past few weeks. So we will describe on this panel why that has not happened. Uh, I'm sure you know everybody on the panel, Senator George Mitchell, Bob Woodward, Senator Olympia Snow. And uh, Senator Snow, let me start with you. What has caused, since you left Congress, uh, decrying such partisanship? Uh, is this worse than it's ever been before? Well, absolutely, and certainly uh, with my own experience. And it just didn't develop since I left. It was the reason why I left, because of the polarization, the partisanship uh, that had been elevated to such a point that it really impeded our ability to solve any problems. And I had always you know, made the promise to myself that I would be there as long as I could solve problems. And that we weren't going to be able to change the dynamics within the institution. It ha that fight had to occur outside of the institution because of so many manifestations of ideological interest groups, minority interests, uh, that actually are now really central to driving the legislative agenda, driving the elections, uh, rather than the lawmakers and the political leaders themselves. So much had changed, and we've seen that with the homogenization of, of districts and the House of Representatives, um, and the same is true in the Senate. Uh, do, you, do you think that homogenization and gerrymandering are a main driver of this? I think it's certainly a contributing element. How do we and get out of that? I would support independent redistricting commissions, such as uh, in the state of Maine uh, that we have, and about a dozen states across this country. So you take it out of the, you know, the partisan nature of the redrawing those lines and have more independent districts. Uh, frankly, that has to happen because you, know, you can replace the lawmakers, but if you don't change the dynamics in the districts, and this is critical right now, is to lay the foundation and the groundwork to get it done for the next census in 2020. It's gonna be an imperative. Opening up primaries is another way. So you have less fringe candidates less ideologically stride, more center-right and center-left than what's emerging from the primary system today. You know, but that, and the primaries, of course, are connected to the gerrymandering, because if you're always scared about being primaried from your extreme flank, mm -hmm. it's because you're in a district like that. And it's interesting what you said. I hadn't thought about it. We have about four years to get this right before the 2020 redistricting starts being done. So it would be great to start a movement to say, let's have independent redistricting. Bob, I think um, Congressman Boehner this morning is going to announce that they'll move the uh, debt ceiling, uh, a short-term extension, so that he and uh, uh, President Obama and others can try to work out a larger deal that would be tied to the debt ceiling. So maybe we've got a few weeks of relief Tell me about the relationship between Boehner and President Obama. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, S Senator Snow's right. Some of this is the way the institutions are functioning, but I, I tend to think that the personalities also drive this. And unfortunately, uh, President Obama and Speaker Boehner have not spent enough time together. I, last week I was listening to a local judge here in a case and he asked one of the lawyers, uh, he said, from the bottom of my soul, what do you want? What do you have to have? And they have not developed this relationship so they can find the buttons on each other's console to press of what really is needed. And, uh, you know, I think, I think that is driving it. I've written about this, but they would have some meetings uh, for instance, one in 2011 where uh, Speaker Boehner went over to the White House. They went out on that patio outside the Oval Office and uh, they were going to get to know each other. And uh, Obama had iced tea and uh, was chewing a Nicorette. Uh, and Boehner had a glass of wine and was smoking. And <laughs> It sends a subtle message, and you know you you need to. I think one Obama's. One time we would have wanted somebody to start smoking again. So just yeah, to buy and and to it. have a drink, and you know the, the I, I wouldn't put everything on this, but you know if you're 
let's have a drink together and somebody has wine and somebody orders iced tea, you're kind of saying, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the other side here. And um, that's, that's really unfortunate. Senator and Mitchell, it was totally different with you and Bob Dole, and I think it started the day you were elected uh, majority leader. Uh, yes, before I get to that, I, I'm surprised I got so far because I don't drink. <laughs> I never had a drink, and I'm... I'm Please, I was able to make it this far. Uh, the day that I was elected Senate Majority Leader, uh, I called Bob Dole, who was then the Republican leader, and went to see him. And I said to him that uh, you've been here 30 years, I've only been here a couple of years, so you know a lot more than I do. But my impression is that uh, these are very tough jobs in the best of circumstances, and if there's no trust between us, there the jobs will be impossible. So I said to him, I'm here to tell you how I intend to behave toward you and to ask that you respond in the same way. And I, there was nothing major or complicated about it. I set forth a few general principles. I said, I'll never surprise you, which is important in the Senate. I won't try to embarrass you. I won't criticize you personally. Simple things like that. He was delighted. We shook hands. And uh, during the six years that we served together, I as majority leader, he as minority leader, never once did a harsh word pass between us, publicly or privately. To this day, we remain good friends. And what about uh, Senator Reid and Senator McConnell? To what extent do they have that relationship? Uh, I don't know the nature of their relationship. I'm, I'm, I'm not there now, but uh, we, uh, we still disagreed. We disagreed every day, but it was civil, uh, we confided in each other. We had dinner probably once a week or so, and uh, we got along well. I don't, I don't think, I do, I do want to say, uh, uh, talking about how tough it is now, it is tough, but I don't think there has ever been a time in American politics when it wasn't rough and tumble. You can go back to the 1800 election between Jefferson and Adams and find all kinds of colorful quotes and insults that were hurled back and forth. There are differences now. What are the and differences? Well, you touched on one uh, uh, with Olympia. The redistricting ha is transforming American politics. It and means isn't that the ideological separation of the two parties well, different than well, it's been well, in the yeah, past? Yes, sure. In the House of Representatives, Charlie Cook has written on it, many have, uh, fewer than 50 seats are genuinely competitive as between the parties. And that means that the pivotal moment in elections is no longer the general election, but it's the primary. And as we all know, in this country, we have abysmally low participation in all elections, 50 to 60 percent in hotly contested presidential elections, fewer in the midterm elections, and a tiny fraction in the nominating but, process, but which, when you which, were majority, means, yeah. which means that the, the most extreme and active elements on both sides have a hugely disproportionate effect in the process if they but, can but elect it is different now. There's something really different. Uh, in one of the things I've written on this, Mike Summers, who's Speaker Boehner's chief of staff, is quoted saying, we are now primarily a blocking majority. In other words, we're negative, we're going to stop mm -hmm. things. That in itself is sad. Mm -hmm. Imagine a political party declaring we're going to only do negative things, but now it's gone further uh, bringing Obamacare in as the leverage on the debt ceiling and so forth. That's not just blocking something, that's going back and saying we want to rewrite the law that was passed uh, three years ago. You, uh, I mean, look, you know, uh, the president has called it blackmail, and I think it is blackmail. Yeah. I think well, can you can. Yeah, I mean, don't yes, you Senator Snow. Yes, yeah. Well, and it's, it's the ideological groups that are driving the legislative agenda. It's no longer the agenda that's coming from within the institutions among the colleagues uh, in the House and Senate is being driven. In fact, the one tied to the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare was driven by groups outside of the process. They raised the money in the hundreds of millions of dollars now, especially in light of Citizens United. And so they flood the airwaves with invectives. They demonize the opposition. They threaten to have a primary. So, But they're the ones that are really driving it. It used to be that the lawmakers and through the political leadership and the political parties would you know, control the agenda. They know how far to go, where to broker an agreement. And so on, and that's what's not happening today because it's all being done by third-party interest groups, ideologically driven, 
uh, to the extremes. So we have two explanations that have been put on the table here, and I'll describe them as the iced tea explanation and the tea party explanation. <laughs> uh, and I want to uh, probe a bit on the iced tea question because it conflicts with the fact that the tea party. Uh, and the question is, as some people have said in the White House, that if Obama had schmoozed at breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the past two years, every single meal with people in the Republican Party, he would still be getting no votes. That it, and when you had the most schmoozing as president in the history of the United States, Bill Clinton, you still had to pass your economic plan on a straight party vote. Do you think that sort of drinking bourbon instead of iced tea the way Lyndon Johnson did it would have solved the mess we're in because of Tea Party-like groups? Uh, it helps marginally. It's not a decisive factor, and anybody who suggests that schmoozing does the job need only look at the Clinton economic plan, which you described. He was the king of schmoozing, and uh, I, I set in on a lot of it uh, with Republicans. And in the end, after a couple of years of struggle, uh, not one single Republican, House or Senate, voted for his economic plan. Uh, it, when you think about it, it's kind of an insult to a senator or a congressman to suggest that he or she would cast a vote contrary to his or her beliefs or conscience just because the president had you to lunch or put his arm around you. It but does that, help. It but do that misses the point. And, and the point is when you have, you call it schmoozing, it's called communication, where you listen to the other side and they listen to you and you get into an arrangement. And, and we've seen this in the Obama administration. Uh, Speaker Boehner and the president tried to work out these deals as they did in 2010, 2011, 2012, and they fail and they throw it to Mitch McConnell, the Senate Minority Leader, and Joe Biden, and they have about two days, and I've got the notes of these discussions and, and published the conversations, and it is a kind of, it's not schmoozing, it's what do you really have to have, this is what I have to have, and they're able to work out a deal, but th that kind of communication doesn't take place, and. Uh, it takes us to the edge of this cliff, which we live well, in well, right that, now. Those are really two different things. Yeah. One, the latter comment, is a capacity to negotiate in a serious and sustained way, which I submit to you is different from schmoozing and having them for breakfast, lunch. As I said, it's marginal uh, in terms of the real effect. The real effect is the ability of people, political leaders, to sit down in a manner in which you try to understand the other point of view, you listen to the other point of view, you try to accommodate the other point of view while remaining true to your principles, and understand that in a country as large and diverse as this, uh, you don't always get your way. What we have now is not negotiation. It isn't schmoozing. You have a demand from one side. You accept what we want, or the government will shut down, and the government will default. I think all, when you, all the schmoozing in the world wouldn't, wouldn't affect that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and part of the other dimension of the problem that Senator Mitchell would appreciate, because it's far different when he was the majority leader, is the fact is, just on both sides, is the breakdown in the legislative process to the point we can't even pass the budget. But it's true. There's no means, there's no bridge to, uh, for both sides to come together anymore because you're not going through, you know, the amendment process, the committee process. I, uh, I often used to threaten to go to the floor and have a refresher course on how a bill becomes law, like in Schoolhouse Rock, because it no longer resembles anything. And therefore, you can't build that, that consensus because compromise and consensus are viewed as capitulation today. And that's why we have to get back as the public to reward bipartisanship and compromise and consensus. If we value it and demand it, we'll get it. How do you get that to happen? I mean, you have a people, as you said, on the extremes who are spending large amounts of money and an incredible amount of energy. How do you energize the center? You, well, first of all, you obviously through elections. You know, demand to know in debates, hold the candidates accountable as to whether or not they're gonna make the system work. And that's, well, that'll be true in the presidential campaign, frankly, in 2016. How are you going to make the process work? 
uh, for in the best interest of the country and the relationship that develops between the executive and, and the legislative branch. But the public has to be engaged. I, th I thought it was deeply troubling the other day. There was a pre-wisdom assumption uh, story that was written in Politico, and one of the pre-wisdom assumptions that didn't uh, bear truth was the fact there'd be a public outcry, um, you know, against lawmakers if, uh, because of a shutdown, and that the public outcry didn't happen. It, yes, it shows in the polls, but people aren't calling up and emailing their lawmakers and saying how outraged they are. So we have to weigh in the system like the fringe do and the minority interests that have really, you know, captured the The one the, group that weighed in in the past few days is the business community. The business community used to weigh in pretty heavily, uh, and people were objected to it sometimes, but it was a sort of stabilizing force. What's happened to the business community in America? Well, and they obviously try to weigh in, but it's also outweighed by those groups because they're the ones that underwrite these campaigns. And 71% of the activities they underwrite oppose candidates, they attack candidates, they demonize the other side. And frankly, we're in a world where the politics is all about destruction and vilification, not about reconciliation mm -hmm. and building constructive solutions. And, and Walter, I think that we need to step back a little bit, and it's not just the daily back and forth about is the government shut down, when, it's, when is it going to be reopened? What about the uh, capacity to borrow the debt ceiling? But the sadness in this and the tragedy is that the real problems of the country and the fiscal issues like the entitlement reform, tax reform, and I think if there's a, uh, a real tragedy in this country, it's the millions of people who are unemployed who can't find jobs. And so they're diddling with all of this stuff and the big issues they are not addressing. Uh, take entitlement reform, Senator Mitchell and I uh, have talked about this. When I interviewed President Obama, uh, last summer, for my book, he said, oh yeah, entitlement reform, cutting entitlements is bad politics for Democrats. I think that's true, and there's been a lot of resistance. But he then said to not cut entitlements is untenable. And that's a very strong word from a president. President, on the record, not cutting entitlements, untenable. And we have done nothing on that issue, which is the real big long-range spending problem in this country. And so, uh, you know, in the end, and I, you know, both sides and certainly the Republicans are blackmailing the president and he should not submit to, to blackmail. But in the end, they have to govern. And, and the, particularly the president has to govern. And the Constitution's very clear, the old former federal judge, that the responsibility on all of these fiscal and budget issues is a shared responsibility of the Congress and the President. But the President has a, a gigantic leverage in this, uh, just because of the office, because of the aura of the office. And I, and I think uh, Obama has held back too much. Senator Mitchell, Congress. what would you do now? Well, I think that the likely outcome, although I have no inside information on which to predict with certainty, but the likely outcome is a package which, uh, uh, in which there's no change on the health care uh, bill. I, I, I think Obama cannot, should not, and will not yield to the demands that they reform, repeal, or delay the health care bill black in this concept. Yeah, it's what yeah, it is. It is and and, and it, he would, if he did that, he could count on that for the rest of his presidency and probably for future presidents as well. So I think there's no possibility of that occurring. But if you, if you meld it into the uh, debt ceiling extension increase, there are plenty of things that you can do uh, to accommodate people who are on the losing side. Uh, it's a time-honored mechanism to have a commission or a committee or a group to study to make recommendations. There are lots of other things you can do. Uh, there's, there's plenty that needs to be done, certainly, to get the economy But if you were in sitting area. in the Oval Office now, yeah. if you were president, you pick up the phone, what number would you dial? Well, I, the president has called Boehner. Boehner's going there today. 
and uh, my hope is that they'll figure out a way to come up with something. So that Boehner and Obama too should sit down quietly and give Bob yet another afterward to his book. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it has to be the two of them, or they want two others or four yeah, yeah. others. I, that, that, to in me, other words, that's a small not group in the Oval Office. I think a small out. group. I think they can figure out a way. It would be a fig leaf. Obviously, it's not going to be a major concession. But so the guy doesn't walk out the door having been totally defeated and having nothing to come to go back home. When with. you did Northern Ireland, it was said of you that he finally just outlistened us. I think was that the phrase. <laughs> yeah, that was to my great regret. That was accurate. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was on the first day of negotiations. I said to the delegates in a, in a moment of hubris and arrogance, which I deeply regret. I said, I'm a product of the US Senate, which has the rule of unlimited debate. I've heard 18 hour speeches, 16, 12 hour speeches. I can take anything you can guys throw at me. For years, they threw it at me. Uh, and uh, I, th when I said that, I thought it'd be a few months. It turned out to be five years. And I listened, listened, listened. And in the end, I did. I, I outlisted them. But the, but the important. And you were successful. Yeah, yeah but, the, but the reason I was successful is that. First off, both sides want an agreement. If one side doesn't want an agreement, there isn't any power on earth that's going to create an agreement. Let's be clear about that. Secondly, there were enough issues that when I drafted that agreement, I could include something for everyone. Everybody had something that they I was a politician, and these guys were all politicians. And I knew that when the agreement was signed, they would have to walk out to their constituents and explain why they did it. And they had to have something that served their self-interest. Now, that, that, I think, is the key to it. It's very difficult in the current circumstance. I think the Republicans have gotten Boehner into such a difficult position that he can't come out and claim victory. But he ought to be able to come out and claim something that gives him at least face saving for the next time you go around. The way you did it reminds me of my historical favorite figure, Benjamin Franklin, who at the Constitutional Convention said, you know, all these things are flying all over the place. And he said, OK, we all have to sit around and listen to what's important to each person in this room and try to put together a package that will work. And he had a wonderful phrase, which was, compromisers may not make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. That's the core of what a democracy is. How do we get compromise, Senator Snow, not to be an ugly word? Uh, it has to come from the public to demand it again, to value it. You know, uh, the late uh, Senator Warren Rudman said, politics is, is too important to be left to the politicians. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Uh, because of where we sit today, we have to insist and, and demand it. Um, it is compromise and consensus building are, you know, the essential agreements uh, for, for the progress that they can generate. And that's no longer happening today. They don't, as you know, Bob pointed out and Senator Mitchell pointed out, that people don't sit down and talk with one another, uh, whether it's the president, the leadership, or members of Congress. Uh, but they get to respect differing views. They can't insist on getting 100% of what they want. They don't have a monopoly and all the great ideas. It's a give and take process. I've been part of it for all my 34 years. And unfortunately, uh, it ebbed away. Just to illustrate how different it is, in 1995 and 1996, during that shutdown, um, it prompted the revival of the centrist coalition that was formed by uh, then John Bro, the senator from Louisiana, and the late Senator uh, John Chafee of Rhode Island, that had been used in the, during the health care debate uh, in the initial years of the Clinton administration. And it was revived, and there were almost 30 of us uh, in the Senate, equally divided between Democrats and Republicans practically. And we, did, we, we decided that we were going to draft a budget during the midst of this shutdown. It turned out to be a balanced budget. And we used it because we were so concerned uh, and alarmed about how this would affect the American people and the confidence in their institutions and their lawmakers. Today, you can't build those coalitions. You could build one in the Senate, perhaps, but not the House. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say that's right, because it's not even a critical mass. And even in the Senate, you've got a lot of good lawmakers who want to make the process work. But as you know, it's just unfolded that the, the outside is driving a lot of the agenda. So hence, what you get is sort of up and down votes in the Senate, similar to what was in the House of Representatives. 
in the, so each side offers their political party position, and when it fails, they take it to the next election, rather than trying to resolve the differences, which was what would occur under Senator Mitchell's leadership in the Senate. It was a very different time than what it is today, so it would become more like a parliamentary system. Walter, can I just say, when Franklin said the words that you repeated, there were four million Americans clinging to the Atlantic seaboard, almost entirely homogeneous right. in terms of race, religion, and background. Today, there are 315 million Americans of every conceivable background. This is an immense, diverse country. And the notion that anybody's going to get their way 100% of the time, or even 90% of the time, is inconsistent with the reality but of that, American that life. But that means that what Franklin said is more true today, not it less is true. It's absolutely okay. more true today. And, and that's protecting what, Dr. That's Franklin. That's what here. makes the tactics that are being employed by this group so out of place in our society. You do what I want or I'll burn the house down. I mean, it's an unreasonable position that has to be recognized and rejected as such. It is not a mechanism for compromise or negotiation. It is the, it is the, uh, the reverse of that. But, but another difficulty here is how success gets measured. And uh, in the media, the internet cable news culture is driven by two things, impatience and speed. And uh, I know this in the White House or up in Congress, when they have a good day in the messaging wars, they're high-fiving each other and say, we won, and they think that's a victory. And they get daily victories or weekly victories, and they're not thinking about the long-term governing, solving the real problems. And to what extent problems. does the polarization in the media uh, start driving the extremes. Yeah, it clearly amplifies it, and so everyone will run out with their sound, sound bite, and you, you see these people who are sophisticated uh, public officials sitting around trying to concoct some email that's clever and uh, sounds, uh, you know, puts it in that high five you know, mode of, oh boy, we really stuck it to them, and that has nothing to do with governing. Yeah, that, what, what they forget is that the process never ends. Yeah. When you prevail on one issue today, once you get past the headlines, you start on the next issue. The negotiating and rule you, is you, 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 each side has to have dignity. That, and they have right. to leave not just with something they can go out and, and tell their constituents about, but they need with inside of themselves to feel, well, okay, I have my dignity. If, if you crush the other side you, in politics, you wind up losing also. Well, messaging has replaced legislating. It's all about messaging. Every, every vote, every, if there are amendments crafted uh, towards messaging for, to appeal to the political base to raise money rather than legislating good solutions for the future of this country. The point is we just never have that opportunity. It's rare. The immigration debate in the Senate, I think it was a lesson of how the process should work. That's the way it should work, and it should work that way continuously on the, on the big issues. But we never, get, we never got the opportunity to address the big issues, like Bob was mentioning, that has neglected uh, the economic future of this country uh, that's in peril. Real quickly, in the last few moments, is the, could the fever break? If they solve this thing, could we have a couple of years in which it's not all about uh, burn down the house? Well, don't we all wish that to be the case? And don't we all know it's not going to be the case? Oh, okay. <laughs> all change in government, unfortunately, only comes from crisis. And it, so, in a sense, a crisis could be really bad, like a default on the debt, even for a short period of time but you need something to jolt the system and get to the point that Senator Snow is driving us of, you know, let's be reasonable and uh, let's look at the large problems rather than the pettiness. And the, the, it's the smallness of this mm -hmm. that is the real disease. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, Lady Brett, I think, says at the end of uh, one of Fitzgerald's books, uh, wouldn't it be pretty to think so, uh, that the fever could break? Uh, I do think that besides reading Bob's uh, epilogue and many other things, they should read the third volume of Robert Caro, where he brings in Everett Dirksen 
and needs a support on a bill, and they just talk and talk and talk. Finally, when Dirksen says, okay, I'll do it, and Johnson says to him, and you'll co-sponsor it. And he's so beaten down, he says yes, and then finally he says, and your name's going to come first. It'll be Dirksen Mansfield. Uh, that ties in everything from what you said, which is a personal leadership, really getting to know people, but also parties knowing what the true interests of the American people are. This is an amazing panel. Y'all are an amazing group. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.